I want to remind you that this is a house of miracles. I'm not doing a series on house of miracles. I'm not trying to brand a phrase. I'm just trying to remind us of who we are. We are children of a miracle working God. God's been reminding me that I live in a house of miracles. Every night I go to bed next to a woman, my wife, who is supposed to be dead, according to doctors many years ago. She is a miracle. Every night I, I kiss my daughter goodnight. She goes to bed. She wasn't supposed to survive the pregnancy. She is a miracle. I live in a house of miracles. You're worshiping in a church that it was founded in Dodge City, Alabama with a population of 491 residents and it became one of the largest churches in the state of Alabama. You worship in a house of miracles. I want us to know that's our identity. We serve a God who does things that are unexpected, are not supposed to be happening and you need to say, I'm ready for mine, you know? I'm ready for my unexpected thing to happen in my life because God is a God of the miraculous. I need an amen if you believe all that. All right, so I want to lean into that today, and I want to start out with just the question of, well, like, what is a miracle? And this is my definition. This is just something I made up. I think it's a good word. When, when the God of heaven supernaturally intervenes on earth, God just does something. It's beyond what you can do. He just steps in, and he makes it happen. And I want us to lean into that in this season. I want us to expect, I want us to ask for it and to believe. Now, there are a lot of people who don't believe miracles still happen, that miracles died out with the early apostles in the first century. But the Bible doesn't say any, there's nothing about the Bible that is limiting like that. The Bible tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus, when he was on the earth talking to his disciples, he said, I'm going to go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. And the same works that I have done, these miraculous works you're going to do, and you're going to do greater things because the Holy Spirit comes. Well, the Holy Spirit's still here. Can I hear an amen to that? In fact, the book of Acts tells us that the Holy Spirit uh, is given to you and your children and as many as will believe afar off. That's what the book of Acts says about the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, go back in the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Check those messages out. But that gift is eternal. And what the Holy Spirit does is he, he makes us supernatural beings where miracles can happen. Now, today, I want to talk about power over darkness. A lot of the modern church is... is uh, rightly so optimistic and kind of flowery and good news because there's a lot of good news. But I want to I want to take you to some places in scripture that should get your attention a little bit because it points out there is a very real darkness in the world. And I hope you're ready for it. If you're ready, say I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, so go with me to Ephesians chapter six. It says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, human beings, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Nothing you can see is really your enemy. Stop and think about that for a minute. Our fight is against unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Don't be confused to think that that means heaven, the God of heaven type things, but it means in the atmosphere. Okay, So th this brings about some stuff that we don't like to maybe think about, but the true demonic influence of a dark world. Now, most of us would agree that this is a dark world and it seems to be getting darker and darker. And what this tells us is that Christianity is not a playground, it's a battleground. It's a place where we go to war against spiritual enemies. It's not just flesh and blood. It's not just things that we can see and we can understand. And so the battle that you're waging, you are not, your enemy is not your ex. Three giggles, two amens. That's better than I got in the last service. I'm going to be honest with you. Your battle is not your boss. Your battle is not your Facebook foe. Certainly it's not your spouse. Even if you're in the worst marriage, that's not, that's not who you're battling. Scripture makes it very plain. It's a spiritual battle. And if you fight a spiritual battle, it has to be a spiritual approach to that battle. So where does that spiritual enemy come from? Well, they're demons. And, and I'm not going to go too deep into the theology behind it. You can read Isaiah 14 or Revelation 12 if you want to know more about that. But essentially, you have a fallen angel, Lucifer 
who rebelled against heaven and was cast out of heaven and with him one third of the angels and those today are demons. What angels are to God, demons are to Lucifer, to Satan. And he does, uh, they do his bidding. Now, we make some mistakes about demons. Two of them real quick I put in your notes if you're following along, fill in the blanks here. First mistake about demons is that we overemphasize demonic influence. The devil made me do it. Son, why did you do it? The devil, dad. The devil made me do it. My boy used to run that one on me pretty regularly. Okay. And that's okay because he's eight. If you're still running that play and you're 28, okay, you need to get beyond it. If you're 48, the devil made me do it. It's not cool anymore. Okay. You need to realize uh, that there's not a devil behind every, you know, bush and tree. You know, well, the devil took all our money. Well, it's funny because I was scrolling on Facebook and you were at the beach last week. Might be the beach took some of your money, you know. I noticed that nice ride you're rolling in. Maybe that payment took some of your money. Like, we can't blame everything on the devil. I mean, I realized that a lot of my problems happened because I happened. Can I get an amen? amen? That's some of the problems, you know. Well, the devil made me eat that. I was losing weight and the devil made me eat. I know that feeling, but it really was not the devil. A lot of my problems are self-inflicted. So it's a mistake if we overemphasize demonic influence. But the second one is a larger mistake, and that is when we underemphasize demonic influence. This is the one Satan wants you to fall to. Because you can't defeat an enemy that you don't acknowledge exists. He doesn't want you to believe there's anything spiritual at all. This is all hocus pocus stuff. There's no proof in it. You know, there's no proof you've got a brain, okay? You have never seen it. You know, there's a, this is a faith world. You have to believe in things you can't see. Some of you have given evidence that you don't have a brain, but we'll move on from that. There's no evidence for a lot of things, okay? And Satan loves for you to not believe that he's there, but you have to recognize there is a true enemy. And if you don't recognize there's a spiritual enemy, you're going to be fighting all your enemies in the flesh. And there's no solution when you're fighting the wrong enemy. There is no solution to fighting the wrong enemy. Now, what do demons do? A couple things I want to point out to you. First of all, demons tempt you to sin. They can't make you sin. The devil didn't make you sin, but they absolutely show up and they speak in your ear and they tempt you. Now, there's scripture that explains that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 26, Paul uh, founded this church. He's speaking to Timothy, his son in the faith, who's the pastor of this church. And he's talking about people they're trying to reach with the gospel. And he says they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to his will. This is, this is demonic activity whispering in your ear to try to trap you and keep you from being who God wants you to be. They'll tempt you. They'll convince you. They'll lie to you. They'll put a spirit of fear on you that will capture you and you're afraid of everything. Or a spirit of unforgiveness where all you can see is the offense. The Bible actually talks about a spirit of offense. You've been offended and all you can see is the offense. All you can see is what they did to you. You can't see what you did to them. There's no room for repentance. All you can see is the offense. That leads to unforgiveness which uh, raises up bitterness and all kinds of hurt and harm in your own life. And those are all demonic influences. A spirit of jealousy. All you can see is, 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 is what they have and you wish you had or a spirit of lust. And every time you see a person of the opposite sex, your thought goes to the wrong thoughts. That's all demonic influence. And they'll lie to you things like, hey, you deserve this. It's no big deal. It's not hurting anybody else. You're better than other people. I mean, you're way better than that other guy. And you continue to hear those voices long enough and, and it leads you down a path that is going to harm you and your family and your future. And see, demons will do two things about temptation. First thing demons do is minimize the sin. It's not a big deal. It's, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Uh, those preacher types, they're making a bigger deal of it than it should be. The first thing they do is minimize the sin. Then the second you commit the sin, the demon keeps talking to you and he maximizes the sin. Look how terrible you are. You, you a hypocrite. God could never love you. You don't belong in a church. What are you doing at that church? Get out of there. All those people are better than you. You see, it's all lies of the enemy. And if you've ever heard anything in your spirit or in your head uh, like what I just said, let me have an amen to that. Amen. 
That's almost all of us, you know. It's no big deal. And the minute you step over the line and you do that thing, look how terrible you are. God could never love you. Let me tell you, those are not inventions of your mind. Those are demonic influences that are called to tempt you and pull you away from the plan of God. And that's actually the second point. Demons distract you from God's will. They don't want you to get there. And so they distract you. And Paul, again, writing to, first, to Timothy, he says, the Holy Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some people will abandon the faith. These are believers. They're going to abandon the faith following deceiving spirits. See that? Look here. Capital S, the Holy Spirit. Lowercase s, non-God spirits. Okay, demonic spirits. And things taught by demons. Believers, people are, are going to be drawn away. Now, when a demon teaches you, he doesn't show up in a red suit with horns and a tail and a pitchfork and say, well, you know, the Bible's not really authoritative. You don't have to believe that part. That's not how a demon teaches you, okay? But there are spirits that motivate and lead other people, and in your mind, you just start to believe that's not important. It's not all that important. And, and in fact, there's a whole army of what I call Google scholars out there. Google scholars. And, 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 and all you got to do is ask them whatever question you want. Type it into Google. They'll pull a verse over here and they'll misrepresent a verse over there. They'll give you a hodgepodge version of, of, of what the Bible says. And they'll, they'll, they'll do exactly what this says. It'll cause you to abandon the faith or deceive you with things that are not actual truth. And listen to me, there's an army of them. Telling you the Bible's not real. That Bible didn't really mean what it says about gender, sexuality, tithing, about Jesus, about the supremacy of Scripture. I mean, it's all over the place and it's full of it. And, and listen, I got to tell you the truth. We're going to all stand before a holy and righteous, perfect God someday. I want to be standing on the Word of God in that moment, not on the Word of Google in that moment. I don't want to believe that kind of stuff. So here's what you need. I'm going to tell you out of love because I'm your pastor. Two things you need if you're a believer. You need, number one, to know the Word of God. Let it speak to you. Let it speak to you. What do I mean by that? You open it up. You read it day by day by day, turning one page at a time, and let it say whatever it wants to say. We don't do that as Christians. We go to Google, we type in our question, and some Google theologian, our Google prophet, has pulled a verse from here and a verse from there, and they have found whatever their flesh really wants the Bible to say, they have found a way to phrase it in that way. I'm preaching better than you're amening right now. Catch up. This is the truth. Whatever you wanted to say about the holiness of God, about sexuality, about, about, about uh, the institution of marriage or sex or about giving or finances, there's somebody who has pulled this and that together and they've put it all together and that, that, that's what they've done. Here's what you need to do. Don't Google your way into God's word. Read it day by day by day by day. Let it speak to you. Don't go, what does the Bible say about so-and-so? That's not how you find it out. Read it every day. God will find you. The Bible says God's word is alive. It's like no other book ever written. It will find you. You flip it and write on the day you needed to read it. Bam, it will be right there. Google doesn't do that. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. All right. She can't do that. All right. You need the two things you need. You need the Bible. You need to know the Bible and you need a, a trusted pastor in your life. I don't mean to sound self-serving, but I'm telling you that's God's plan. That there's somebody in your life that's their calling, it's their life's calling to know the scriptures, to share it with you in a godly way, in God's timing over the family of faith, and, and that's what you need. This idea of free agent, I'm going to go to church sometimes, and that church wasn't holy enough, and I'll just check out seven different churches online, and I'll check here and there, and I don't like what they said about that because I Googled the other thing. Let me tell you, that is not the Christian experience. That's what I call Christian free agency. Okay, that, that's not the way God wants it to be. God wants you to lock into your church, go where God is leading that church and, and receive God's word on a daily basis. Find some friends to do a Bible study with you. Get connected and read the Bible together and let God's word speak to you. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. What pop culture will tell you is it doesn't really, really matter what you believe as long as you believe. 
Just, just, just be sincere in what you believe and don't judge anybody with what they believe and that's fine. It doesn't really matter. And so you can pull a few Christian verses together and you can pull some from uh, Buddhism and you know, the New Age and Eastern mysticism and this book or that book and really you just kind of round out whatever you want. Let me just go ahead and tell you, the Bible does not participate in that. Amen. The Bible just doesn't. The Bible clearly says there is only one word of God and this is it. The Bible says in uh, Matthew 5 and 18 that not one jot or tittle of Scripture will, 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 will uh, pass away until it's all fulfilled. I like that little phrase. You have to go to the King James Version to find jot and tittle. In the New Translations, it says not one stroke of a pen. Like literally it means like one period, one comma. One dot of an eye. What it means is every bit of God's word is separate from everything else. Jesus said there's no other way to heaven. Paul says there's no other name but Jesus whereby we must be saved. And so if you're pulling from here or there, you've been deceived. That's the job of a demon, to whisper in your ear pop culture. And see, here's the thing. What I'm trying to do is follow the taught line of God's plan and God's word. Is that what we're all trying to do? Amen. Just here's what it says. Here's what I want to do. And pop culture is getting farther and farther and farther away, making you seem as a true believer more extreme by the day. But make no doubt about it. You're not extreme. They're extreme. You're just doing what God's word says, and we want to stay there because when this all ends, which, by the way, is coming fast, and it's a temporary world at best, when it all ends, what we've done with Jesus is what's going to stand forever. Amen. Amen. Are you getting anything out of this? I'll start over if I need to. All right. Here's the last thing. What do demons do? They attack to harm God's people. God so loved you that he gave his only son, Jesus. He loves you that much. And so you are simultaneously the object of God's love and the object of Satan's hate all at the same time. Amen. Because God loves you so much, the demonic world hates you that much and wants to harm you. There's scripture uh, in Matthew 17 of a, of a boy that was uh, being attacked by, by demons and falling into the fire and falling into water. And he, they came to Jesus. Jesus commanded the demons to let him go. Jesus took authority over the demons. You need to understand you are under attack because you're the apple of God's eye. There's a verse that says that. The, what does that mean? I, I wanted to know that and I researched it deeply and it literally means the center point. It means he can't not see you. If he looks this way, he sees you. If he looks left, right, up, down, if he closes his eyes, he sees you. He placed you there. And there's no way he can see the world without loving you. And because he loves you that much, Satan hates you that much. And because you're under attack, you need the church. Oh, I don't mean you need to join an organization and give money. No, I mean the church is a group of believers who love each other and are going to the same place. I don't just mean heaven someday. I mean we're going into the will of God. So people who understand your, your, your challenges, understand your calling, who will pray for you, stand with you in agreement for the miraculous and for protection over your life, people who will hold you accountable, people who will encourage you and lift you up and even correct you if need be, that's what the church is all about. And see, Jesus died for that environment and that arrangement. He said, clearly, I didn't come for the, well, uh, for the healthy, I came for the sick. I didn't come for the wealthy, I came for the poor. I didn't come for the people who were righteous, I came for the sinners. And he came to love and deliver and set us free, give us abundant life. And then he gave us the contrast of what Satan came for. Watch this. The thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, no, I've come to give you life more abundantly. Amen. So that is the spiritual battle that you have in your life. Everything the enemy does, depression, fear, division in your home, bodily sickness, this is all the plan of Satan in your life. Now, <laughs> this is the part where I get to turn the page because this has all been kind of spooky so far. Demons and devils and stuff like that. And it's not to scare you, but it's to tell you this other part is what matters most, that Jesus has also come. And he's come to give you abundant life. So, so all this scary stuff about demonic forces and, and, and darkness leads me to this point. I want you to know if you get nothing else, hear this statement right here. You 
have miraculous, say it with me, that word, authority over darkness in the name of Jesus. That's so good. We're going to say it together. You have miraculous authority. over darkness in the name of Jesus. Jesus. You have authority. Say that word again, authority. 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 Sometimes you may not feel like you've got power, but you always have authority. It's like a police officer. Maybe she was the runt of the whole group that went through the training. Maybe she's on her first day of work, not really sure of herself. She got out there. Her radio's not working. She can't even call anybody. All she's got is a uniform and a badge, and she needs to stop an oncoming 18-wheeler in the highway. And there stands the smallest little police officer, and she squares her shoulders, and she puts her hands out. And although she doesn't have the power to stop an oncoming 18-wheeler, she has authority. And he knows he has to stop. And if he doesn't stop, he will answer to an even higher authority. I need you to know this. Among all this demonic world and all of this world that is running away from the purpose and plan of God, you represent the highest authority in the whole world. That's the name of Jesus. And so where you don't have knowledge to figure it out or words to say or wisdom to understand, you have authority in Jesus. Your words matter when you pray, when you call on the name of Jesus. You may not know what all the details are, but you're calling on a name that's above every other name. Here's what Jesus said about that authority to his disciples. He called them together and the scripture says he gave them authority to drive out spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. You know who he gave it to? Disciples. That's what I am. That's what you are. We're followers of Jesus. And, and when I need a miracle in my life, I want you to think about it like this. There's usually a physical, natural thing I can do and a supernatural thing, spiritual thing I can do. Usually. I, my body's sick. I can go to a doctor. Thank God for wise doctors that you know, we, we have spirit-filled, God-led doctors in leadership who attend and volunteer at this church. I know they hear from heaven. Thank God for people like that. Go, the physical thing you can do is go to that doctor. And at the same time, you can do something that is spiritual and you can call on the great physician who heals every disease. If you're dealing with depression, bouts of anxiety, just fear, maybe you talk to a medical professional about that or a, at least a counselor that's the physical thing you can do, but you can also spiritually come in agreement for a healing to your mind. There's often something physical. Maybe it's a, a rebellious uh, child in your home, and maybe physically you need to take that phone away. They'll survive without it. Yeah. Okay? But you need to also pray for the God of all power to bring uh, spiritual health and, and, a, and a revival into their home. There's something physical you can do, but there's also something spiritual you can do. And I want you to be aware of the spiritual world, but not afraid of the spiritual world. This is a, a world filled with darkness. But here's the good news. Jesus is the light of the world. You know, when you read uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the Gospels. Gospel means good news. Those are the four people who wrote their experience and what they saw. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels from Two uh, Latin words, sin and optic. Sin meaning same, optic meaning eye. They kind of tell the story through the same eye. But John kind of runs off the reservation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all begin by saying, you know, there was, there was angels and there was a, a manger and there was a baby born and there was a star and the wise men. And John says they're telling all that story. He skips that story and he goes right into who Jesus is. Like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get baby Jesus, you know. And, and in John, you get straight up Jesus is the light of the world. And in the first chapter, he says he was a light and man didn't receive him. But he says, and that light shines in the what, church? Right here where we are. And the darkness can never, come on, somebody say never. Never, never extinguish it. Never means now. It never means right now. Like when that word was spoken over 2,000 years ago, it, 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 it catapulted 2,000 years into 2021. Whatever darkness is in the world, whatever darkness is threatening your world, your future, that darkness cannot extinguish the light 
that Jesus Christ is. And you know what Jesus said to us? He says, now you are children of the light, so walk in the light. Man, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of demons and darkness. I'm not afraid of you know, the attacks of the enemy against me. I'm not afraid of what's unseen and I don't know what's coming at me. And it's not because I'm super whopper holy preacher guy. <laughs> it's because Jesus is a light that shines in the darkness. I never knew when I was a kid growing up how dark the world would become as I became a man. Probably you're seeing things you never thought you would see, but God knew that Jesus would always shine in the darkness and there would never, come on, say it with me a word, church, never. There would never come a time where the darkness was so powerful that the light of Jesus could not dispel the darkness. That time means right now. If there's darkness around your family, the light of Jesus is more powerful. If there's darkness in your mind, the light of Jesus goes there. Your finances are facing a dark situation. The light of Jesus is there. You have to start by being a child of the light. That's really where it begins, that I, I receive you, Jesus. I'm not going to walk in this dark world just uh, letting pop culture, popular thinking guide how I live my life. God, I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to say, have your way in my life, Jesus.